we are one week away from Easter, and like um, Ed mentioned, today, according to Christian tradition, is called the Palm Sunday, mm -hmm. where we commemorate Jesus entering the city of Jerusalem as king. And so, this whole season for us is a high season for reflection, which is what, which is what we've been doing, uh, for asking ourselves, who are we? What story do we belong? And therefore, what are we called to do? And like all of you, I declare Jesus my Lord and my King at my baptism. Like we all say, Jesus is Lord, right? And I think this is the defining identity for all of us that we all hold. I'm sure you agree. But um, what that identity really is depends on what kind of king we think Jesus is. And that is the same question that the citizens of Jerusalem had to wrestle with 2,000 years ago when Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem and the crowd shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, right? Hosanna, the van David. And then uh, it's a like, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So they welcomed Jesus as their king. And the scene was a jubilant scene. But very quickly, they found themselves not quite knowing what to do with him. You know, just a little background here. A century before Jesus' time, in that short span of 100 years, Jerusalem had seen too much turmoil. First, they fought a war of independence, and then followed by a bitter civil war between brothers, and after that, by an invasion of Rome led by the uh, general Pompey. So kings rose, rose after kings, <coughs> rose after kings, and eventually they ended up with a super unpopular king called the King Herod the Great. And so Jerusalem has just seen too much. Then along came Jesus. What kind of king he was, who was supposed to be? And depending on which faction you asked in Jerusalem, he was either a hero or a villain, a prophet or a rebel, a king or a fraud. And Jesus himself made a statement that day about what kind of king he was. Because he came not on a stallion, but on a donkey. He came not commanding an army, but commanding a moral principle that says, do not resist the evil doer. Uh, doer, if anyone strikes on your right cheek, turn the other cheek also. And I'm sure you have never heard of such a strange teaching, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Of course you have. You say you haven't heard of it? Well, not before Jesus. Oh, okay. <laughs> I second that. Because, uh, well, I have to say that this teaching is so widespread in the whole world that even before I was a Christian, I already heard of this saying, and it was in my middle school history class all the way back in Malaysia. And I remember thinking to myself, what kind of crazy idea is this? Am I supposed to just let people walk all over me like a doormat? And then I'm supposed to feel pretty righteous about that? <laughs> well, of course, of course, back then I wasn't speaking with knowledge, but now I'm like you, I'm a Christian. So I have a duty to understand and follow our king's command to turn the other cheek, which is found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 39. So what does it mean to turn the other cheek? Uh, not turn to the Bible, you don't have to. <laughs> um, what does it mean to turn the other cheek? And how should we understand this command? And what do our understanding of this command, or what does this command itself say about our king? I don't know if you've heard of a man called Russell Moore, um, a pretty prominent Christian leader in this country. And he is currently the editor-in-chief of the magazine Christianity Today. And he said in an interview in last year that a good number of Christians nowadays are losing the appetite for this kind of teaching. They told their pastors that turning the other cheek just doesn't work anymore. It's too soft is too weak. So there's a siege mentality that is taking shape among many Christians. A sense that like we've been far too nice for far too long 
So no more Mr. Nice Guy. It's time to let them, whoever them are, taste their own medicine. But these are our brothers and sisters. Why are they so tired of hearing a teaching like turning the other cheek? Whatever, whatever happened to being Bible-believing Christians? So what went wrong in this climate? But in the interest of not confusing us any further than what is already a confusing situation, I'll just cut to the chase and say that for quite a while, we have done a great disservice by propagating among ourselves, among Christians, a bad reading of what turning out the other cheek means. And that bad reading sounds very much like how I thought about this in my middle school time. It goes something like this. I don't need to respond. I don't need to respond to the wrong that's being done to me. I don't have to retaliate. I can continue to love and God somehow will work it out. Does that sound familiar to you guys? It's... I know, it's the paradox. <laughs> yeah, that's oh, I okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a signal from somewhere. <laughs> so, you know, it's a very common advice that we circulate among ourselves, among Christians. But let's just unpack what we just said, what we just heard. Number one, is it wrong to refrain from retaliation? Is it wrong to refrain from re retaliation? No, it's not wrong. Is it wrong to love unconditionally? It's not wrong. So there are, there, there are some truth in there. Because in the same chapter in Matthew, Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of, of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. Therefore, it is our central calling to treat those who oppose us with the same dignity of those who love us. There's just no question about that. But, but is it our calling to not respond to the wrongful acts that are done to us? Is it our calling to seek holiness by enduring pain, sufferings, and injustice without reservations? So, I have to wonder if this is what turning the other cheek is all about. Can we actually demand people or give advice like this to people and expect them to live like this? And how long can people live like this before he or she just snaps? How long can the person live like this before his or her humanity is so warped beyond recognition, so distorted that it just never reflects the image of God anymore, right? It is a premature spiritual death. So to live like this is not the life eternal that the gospel promised. It is torment. It's literally hell on earth. So that's the bad reading of what this command of turning the other cheek is. Still, Jesus commanded us, if anyone strikes on your right cheek, turn the other cheek also. So before you say, oh, I'll turn the other cheek, there's already a first strike on one cheek. A strike on the face is humiliating. A strike on the face meant to intimidate, right? And the strike on the face says, might makes right. A strike on the face says, keep your head down and everything will be all right. And it is easy for us to say, love your neighbor as yourself. But when somebody strikes you on your face, what is the right response? What is the right thing to do to fulfill this greatest command of loving your neighbor as yourself? And we know this commandment comes from Leviticus chapter 19. So I believe it is where that we can find the correct answer to how to respond. It says here in chapter, uh, Leviticus 19, do not hate your brother in your heart, rebuke your fellow, but incur no sin on their account, and do not take vengeance, and do not bear a grudge against your own folks, but love your neighbor as yourself. It says, doing all these, rebuke your fellow. And therefore, when you get a hit on the face, 
If you get back up and you turn the other cheek, it is first and foremost a righteous pushback at the aggression and the wrongdoing of a fellow. Turning the other cheek is a form of self-respect. One cannot say, I love the neighbor as myself if I debase, I debase myself in the beginning. Turning the other cheek is a rebuke at the aggressor, saying that your intimidation is wrong, but it did nothing to diminish my dignity and my integrity. Turning the other cheek is the indomitable courage and grace in telling the aggressor, you don't have to act like this. And we're doing that not with hate, but with love. And the first Christians that we all know were so brave, the first Christians, they bo they're born out of this strange combination of courage and grace. In the face of intense persecutions, as we all know it, mm -hmm. However, despite the kind of persecutions that they had to endure, the apostles did not fall into the temptations of glorifying persecutions for the sake of persecutions. Mm -hmm. Like, or unlike this popular culture that I began this uh, lesson today about um, all about grievance and resentment, mm -hmm. about glorifying this victim mentality, this persecution complex, which are unfortunately affecting many Christians today. Persecution is wrong and is not to be celebrated. Like you know, in Acts 7, there's this very infamous um, killing of Stephen. Mm -hmm. You know, Stephen was persecuted and the story says, saw the proof of the killing him. And that day, a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. And devout men buried St Stephen and made a loud lamentation over him. They lamented. There was no glorification or no sanctification of the wrongful death of Stephen. But Saul was ravaging the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women, and he committed them to prison. So the persecution was really severe. But then the amazing thing happened. The disciples, even though they were scattered, they were not discouraged. They were as hopeful and as courageous as ever. As the story says, now those who were scattered went from place to place, as Saul going from house to house to arrest people. The apostles were going from place to place to proclaim the word. They just cannot be intimidated. They were unstoppable. Their indomitable courage can only come from one place, which is the example of Jesus. Jesus did not back down. Jesus did not run away from the injustice of the cross. The betrayal of his friends, the humiliation and the just morbid violence of the cross did not intimate him. You know that if we take a different perspective, um, not from the disciples' perspective, but if we take the perspective of the power of the day, killing of Jesus was a very calculated move by Pontius Pilate, the, the Roman <coughs> governor, and Caiaphas, the uh, Jerusalem high priest. For, for them, in their playbook, there's an upside of killing a person like Jesus, which is to crush a very popular movement, which to them is a destabilizer of the system. You know, there's also a potential downside because by killing a popular person like Jesus, they could risk instigating a riot. But they must have made a calculated risk that the downside of this riot could be easily managed by the superior military power of Rome. So they have chosen to kill Jesus with the hope that this movement could fizzle out. And so it caught everybody by surprise that none of these both sides of calculation actually took place. The movement did not fizzle out, but at the same time, the followers with their leaders killed did not become militant like the leaders, like you know, the Roman governor expected. Instead, 
the disciples follow a third way. At the risk of their own life, they reach across both sides to the oppressed and the oppressors, telling them, you don't have to act like this anymore. You don't have to harm and you don't have to be harmed. You can change. That's the third way that the disciples do. And one of those people whose life was changed forever because of this was Saul, the oppressor, who later became Paul, the apostle. And he wrote in a letter to the Colossians, he said, reflecting on this uh, third way and its power, he said, Jesus disarmed the rulers and the authorities and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them by the cross. This is found in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. And so Paul understood that turning the other cheek is far from being a passive defense strategy or a survival strategy. It is, in fact, an offensive move. One that, a, a move, an offensive move that people who practice violence, people who practice domination do not understand and they don't actually have a response to. They don't have a defense against this kind of thing. So looking back, the courage of Jesus gave the disciples their indomitable courage. But the killing of Jesus also exposed the injustice of this world and it even convicted the disciples of their own culpability in making this world unjust. And finally, the resurrection of Jesus gave the disciples this undying hope for indeed a good life that is worth living. The unrelenting grace towards a world that is in pain, a world that needs the grace most. And uh, I was looking at a story, uh, somebody who uh, exemplified this understanding of turning out the cheek. And I think one of those people who really understood this teaching and put it into practice was Rosa Parks. Uh, Rosa Parks needs no introduction. <laughs> Every school kid in the United States learned about Rosa Parks. But since I'm not a school kid and I'm not from the United States, I actually had to do some research to catch up in this learning. Um, so uh, what I learned is that Rosa Parks lived in Montgomery, Alabama, in the segregated South during the 1940s. Um, this you probably know. At that time, um, there's a segregation. For example, the front of the city bus was reserved for white folks and the black folks who actually made up of 75% of the bus users had to sit at the back. And in the year 1955, on the first day of December, Rosa Parks took the bus home after a long day of work. And when the seats reserved for the white folks were filled up, the, the front seats, the driver, whose name is James Blake, asked the black folks to get up and make more space for the white folks. And this is actually um, empowered to the drivers according to the city regulations. And one of the people he asked to get up was Rosa Parks and she respectfully refused. And when the driver, James Blake, he threatened that he would call the police, she said, you may do so. In her biography that is written by Douglas Brinkley, which is the distinguished professor of the history of history in the University of New Orleans, Rosa Parks said that um, from my upbringing and the Bible, I learned people should stand up for rights, just as the children of Israel stood up to the Pharaoh. And that is exactly what Rosa Parks did. In the face of injustice, in a system of discrimination and humiliation, she did not back down. She did not retaliate. She simply confronted the injustice with grace, with dignity, and most of all, with courage. And so Rosa Parks turned the other cheek. So now she refused and the ball is back in the court of James Blake, the driver. Would he strike the second time or would he repent? or he make some changes. He, he did, he, uh, he hit the second time, metaphorically speaking. He asked for the police 
and Rosa Parks was promptly arrested. And in an interview 34 years later, the driver, James Blake, said, Well, I had my orders. I had police powers. Any driver of the city did. In other words, his defense was that I meant no harm. I was just doing my job. It was just how things were. But in the words of the poet Amanda Gorman, we've learned that quiet isn't always peace. And the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always justice. So the courage of Rosa Parks at that time became a huge publicity and that put on public display this absurdity of segregation, its self-righteousness, its system violence against God's own children. At that time, it's brothers against brothers, sisters against sisters. And her courageous act provided a huge momentum for this movement that came to be known as the Montgomery bus boycott. And out of this movement came one person that we all know. His name is Martin Luther King Jr. And the rest, as they say, is history. So throughout these 2000 years, from the apostles all the way to Rosa Parks, wherever and whenever we find people who on the one hand reject the victimhood and the victim mindset, as part of the self-identity, uh, and on the other hand, refuse the temptation of power and domination, but choose to walk the third way, unwavering, walking on the third way, reconciling the oppressed and the oppressor under the generous second chance of God, there we will find the kingdom of Jesus. So today on Palm Sunday, as we will remember Jesus, entering his own city on a donkey. His meekness could not conceal his resolve. We read in Isaiah 42, that says, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom I delight. And I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice, and he will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his teaching. This is the king that we celebrate today. Just like the citizens of Jerusalem, they shouted, Hoshana, son of David, save us now, son of David, Blessed, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. As they celebrated, they hadn't realized what would happen in a few days on Passover. But very soon, they would find out. Just like John chapter 13 says, it is before the festival of the Passover. And Jesus knew that his hour had come and to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them. He loved the citizens of Jerusalem. He loved us to the end. In a few days, Jesus would turn his face, his other cheek, to the entire world. And we would betray him. We would deny him. We mock him, spit on him. Pontius Pilate would ask him about all these things that is done to you. Do you not have an answer to all of these? But Jesus would stood tall, but he would remain silent. Because the one who needs to answer to all of these, the one who needs to be held accountable to all of these, is not Jesus. It is the world. It is me. It is you. So, in a week, will be Easter, as we are already preparing ourselves to celebrate. We will celebrate that Jesus as the first fruit of a renewed heaven and earth, a heaven and earth that is healed. So in many ways, it should be the true Christian New Year. But before that, we have to go through this Friday, Good Friday, a day when the sum of all our sins, all our vices will be put on full display by condemning, condemning the innocent man, the king on the cross. So as the saying goes, it is always darkest before dawn. But even then, a spark of hope 
was already ignited and it could not be missed. For it was on that night that Jesus gave us the Lord's Supper. And he said, Take, this is my body, as he broke the bread. And he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them. And all of them drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And truly I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So we are going to take our communion very soon. Let us take this time of doing the communion, uh, communion and also the rest of the week as we prepare for Good Friday and also for Easter. Let us take this time to reflect, to prepare. Let us ask ourselves, is there anything that I have done that contributed to the brokenness of this world instead of to the goodness of God's creation, of God's children? What are the things that I need to ask for forgiveness? And what are the things that I need to change to renew my commitment to Jesus, my Lord and my King? And now I invite you to pray uh, for the communion together. Dear God, dear Father, bless us and give us strength. Keep us and give us peace and renew us and give us rest. For we need your mercy. And we give thanks to you, God. And by the everlasting faithfulness of your covenant, sealed by the blood of Jesus, we pray, amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat>